Creativity in the Age of COVID with Dr. Judy Bloom and Richard Skipper. It's the only program in which therapy and entertainment come together to show everyone not only how to cope in the age of COVID, but how to be creatively productive through it all. And now, Dr. Judy Bloom and Richard Skipper. And here we are, Dr. Bloom. And uh, well, I've got the wrong name here in my thing, so I got to change that. Uh, but that's what happens uh, during, uh, during COVID. So we'll change that right now. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Richard? Oh, I'm doing great, all things considered. Uh, when we first started doing this show uh, back in September, uh, you said your goal and your wish is that we're going to call this creativity after COVID. Mm -hmm. And based on everything that's going on right now, it seems like we're getting closer and closer and closer uh, to that goal. Uh, so uh, what's going on with you, first of all, before we talk about our incredible guest today? I am so excited about who we have joining us today. Yeah, and, you know, we have to be careful. We don't want to get back into real life or normal life too quickly. You know, it's, it's kind of that fine line between embracing the possibilities, what's happening, and yet not doing it too fast. Mm -hmm. so, and I think everybody, and we're going to probably hear that from, from our guests today, that, you know, they're starting to put the put their feet out there, right? You know, toes in the water again. Um, and we just have to be careful we don't jump jump in full force too quickly and then set everybody back. So it's that timeline, well, you know. One thing that you and I have been able to avoid all along, and hopefully we'll be able to avoid that today as well, is bringing politics into this. Mm -hmm. However, that being said, um, I saw an exchange today between one of our congressmen and Dr. Fauci. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. That's very, very heated. And it really is about these issues that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, this congressman is, Senator, is very, very upset that Dr. Fauci is not able to give him definitive answers as to when we will open, when we will get back, uh, all the things that we have to do in order to bring this back. I know that New York uh, is starting to reopen the comedy clubs and the smaller cabaret rooms. Uh, I still am very, very cautious about all of that. Uh, what are your thoughts on everything that's happening? Yeah, and I, and I totally agree. That's why I'm saying we need to be cautious. And, you know, Dr. Fauci, as brilliant as he is, and he is brilliant, uh, doesn't have a, a crystal ball that works. You know? <laughs> so he can't tell you exactly when things are going to happen. I mean, that's totally unrealistic, right? You know, he's waiting for the evidence. He's a scientist. And we all are waiting. You know, that's why I'm saying we need to, you know, take it bit by bit by bit, hope for the best, and, you know, at each step, re-gauge, okay, where are we? Okay, where are we? And I think for the creative community, that's a particular kind of, a ch it's its own challenge because you, you're you planning for months and months in advance mm -hmm. for different events, right? You know, different performances, shows, whatever, months, years in advance sometimes. So it's hard to keep adjusting that time schedule um, and yet still staying you know, firmly committed to what you're doing and really, you know, active in the creative process of it. But I think that's, again, something we can get into more today. Now, let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Um, our first guest, uh, Tom Gabbard, is the CEO of Blumenthal Performing Arts in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, my old stomping grounds, as I said. Looking at his resume, I've got to find out how he ended up in Charlotte. <laughs> uh, maybe he's originally from Charlotte, I don't know. Uh, but they have six performing arts venues uh, if I read correctly, uh, throughout Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, they Their plans were to reopen uh, this summer uh, with theatrical productions. Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina has in more recent years, it wasn't there when I was a kid, uh, has become a hub uh, for many of the touring companies that are touring around the country. Um, I understand, Tom, from what I've read, uh, that you are starting to put a symphony orchestras on stage again, uh, but that you're not bringing uh, Broadway style shows in, at least not yet. Uh, first of all, welcome to today's show. Uh, and I wanna ask you um, what your calendar looked like uh, when everything shut down uh, March of last year. 
Well, we typically do in excess of a thousand performances a year in those six theaters. And and in the Broadway, touring Broadway business are a top 10 market. So we are a hub for all kinds of things. Uh, we'll have as many as 18 to 20 Broadway theatricals, but also music, comedy, resident companies like the symphony. So everything shut very, very quickly. Christian Chenoweth was our last performance, March 11. Wow. Uh, so so we, we are beginning to contemplate uh, a return and the symphony here locally is the first. And, and so they'll be doing a socially distanced performance in April. We have been actively working outside and doing concerts. And in fact, next month, Wynton Marsalis and his jazz septet will be performing outdoors mm -hmm. in a socially distanced manner. But uh, when it comes to, to Broadway and particularly looking at performances that, that, that may occur uh, with limited social distancing, Wicked is the first performance we have teed up to open September 7. Mm -hmm. uh, also in advance of that, something that we're, that we're doing that I think is a good interim that moves outside of these theaters is we're, we're doing a show called Immersive Van Gogh. And this is, this is not in our theaters, it's in a warehouse, a giant warehouse, so we can present it in a socially distant manner. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that will open June 18. And, and, and again, is the kind of experience that we think will prepare people to come back to the theater, to sit together closely. Uh, and so, yeah, th this hybrid of, of, of trying different things that begin to safely re-engage and to, and to reassure people that we can do this safely. That's part of, you know, I think a long-term process that, that hopefully then culminates with Wicked in September. It sounds like you're on track to, to, you know, do exactly what I was just talking about, just kind of slowly, piece by piece, get everybody used to it again, make sure it's safe, make sure it works, all those things. I know I was reading the Hollywood Bowl um, has a full season scheduled actually for this year, but at 25% at the moment, 25% seating capacity. Now, obviously that's something they can't afford to do forever. No. But at least for, you know, the beginning of the season, that's what it's going to be. And then they'll adjust the number of seats that are available as things continue to open in California. So it sounds you're, like you're doing something similar. There's that. Uh, and, and the other thing that's happened in our theaters that have happened in many other theaters during this last year are substantial upgrades to our HVA systems. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that COVID has taught us is that there is a lot more that many of us could do with air filtration and other things to improve the air quality. That's a that's a good long term fix for all sorts of things. Amen. That will make these, Amen. That will, that will make these buildings healthier, and we're we're working with Honeywell. Honeywell now is headquartered here in Charlotte, so we're working closely with them. I uh, halfway seriously, halfway jokingly, have told our staff, you know, we may have people that buy tickets just to come in and breathe the clean air. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. That's great. Our, our dressing rooms will all have uh, uh, small portable HEPA filters in it, so an actor can can look in every dressing room and see that within their dressing room itself, we're actually filtering the air. So lots of improvements in air quality, which is I think a part of the solution, not just short term but long term. Well, I want to ask you, Tom, when everything shut down last year, uh, obviously none of us knew what was ahead of us. Knew, none of us knew where we were headed down this path. Uh, but And this is a question that I've asked mostly performers, but I want to ask you from the other side of the uh, sideline, so to speak. Um, were you able to get started right away in terms of planning ahead, or were you really frozen um, in your uh, footsteps uh, with everything that was going on? Oh, we, we started planning and then replanning and replanning. Uh, a, a booking agent friend of mine, Tema Higgins, yesterday I asked her, she, she represents a lot, of, mm -hmm. a lot of major Broadway tours. And I said, so how many times have you rerouted your tours? She said, five times. <laughs> And, and, and the first time with this was with an expectation that we would be shut six weeks. And then it just kept being extended. So yeah, we have, have planned and replanned. Uh, 
which is, you know, taking its toll on everybody. It's, it's a hard thing to route these tours. And when you have to redo them, the ripple effect on other shows, when you have to move something, uh, especially a big blockbuster show like a Hamilton uh, or Wicked, uh, it has a ripple effect on everything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to bring uh, Scott Siegel on. Uh, Scott Siegel uh, has his own production company uh, here in New York uh, called Siegel Presents. I have known Scott uh, for longer than he's been on the planet, I think. Um, <laughs> I've been lucky enough uh, to appear in one of his productions years ago. Uh, and uh, he is the go-getter uh, in New York. I'm reading a book now called The Go-Giver. Uh, and I think that that's Scott more so than a go-getter because he gives and gives and gives uh, to the theatrical community here in New York. Um, and one of the things that Scott has done that I want him to talk about is he's gone virtual, as many people have. Uh, but what Scott has been able to do, which he can tell us about, is he's been able to figure out a way to pay the artist that are performing virtually, which is something that we all do appreciate. So Scott, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here, thank you. Thank you. So going back again, uh, today marks 397 days, believe it or not, uh, <laughs> since, our, since our theater shut down and everything. I know that you always have something going out there. You're always working on some project. What did your calendar look like uh, on March 11th of last year? Well, uh, I was doing at that point. Uh, we had already started our 20th anniversary season of Broadway by the Year at Town Hall. We had done the first of four shows, but the rest of the season stopped. Uh, there were three more to go. Uh, I was doing about plot producing, directing, hosting about five shows a month that were on schedule for Feinstein's 54 Below, mm -hmm. and um, I had some stuff lined up at uh, Temple Emanuel Stryker Center here in New York. Um, and some shows that were going to be going out of town that of course didn't happen uh, also but but yeah it's just sort of cut the cut us off at the at the neck not at the knees it was uh it was pretty brutal mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, um, so go ahead i'm sorry well i was gonna speak to what you i, I think what you were about to ask me actually uh at, at first i i think just as what tom uh was saying that uh we didn't think it was going to go on quite that long. I was thinking three months, maybe, you know, before we got back, because it was about stopping the curve, uh, uh, flattening the curve. Um, but as things, as it very quickly became apparent, it wasn't going to be quite so short term. And uh, I was actually inspired by a, a news thing that I saw. Um, and I'll probably get this somewhat wrong, but the general idea of it was that um, uh, restaurants were dying because uh, they were closed. And uh, they had all this food coming in from farmers, from farmers markets and stuff that was not being used. And some smart person said, I'm gonna get some donations so we can buy the food from the, uh, from the farmers, get it to the, to the restaurants so that they can make the food and then they can get paid and, from these donations. And, and then we'll give that food to the frontline workers. And I thought that was just beautiful. It was a win-win for everybody. Everybody was getting some money. Everybody was getting what they needed at that moment. And, but what struck me, because at that time, this was in April, I was seeing that uh, all the performers that I knew, and I know a fair number of performers in New York, were That's all on, on YouTube and, and everything else, and then Facebook and Instagram, and, and they were just sort of giving away their gifts for free, you know? And they were the ones who, it was very clear at that moment, were gonna be the last people who were gonna go back to work. And it, mm -hmm. these were the people who needed the benefits, yet they were doing the benefits again, as the show people are always so generous. But it, it just, it was tearing me up that they, that they needed the help more than anybody uh, mm -hmm. uh, on a financial level. So I took that model and, I, and, I, and I, I started a GoFundMe campaign and I asked people to donate so that we could put on concerts and, and so that performers didn't have to beg for money like a tip jar kind of thing and that the money would be there in advance and that they would know they were gonna get paid. And uh, and we put on, I, I figured it would go maybe five or six concerts, but we just did our 20th uh, wow. recently. Uh, but we have almost 300 people who have donated many and many, many of them multiple times uh, and it amounts large and small. And everybody, the perk for the, for the people who donate besides good karma that comes from it and helping is that they are the producers. 
they all get a credit as a producer of the concert, uh, each concert in this long credit roll at the back, back end. And, uh, and, and, and God bless them. We, we have this couple who decided to give us a big matching fund uh, so that it doubled the amount of money we were able to, to, to pay people. Wow. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's not as if the payments are, are keeping, uh, paying people's rents, they're not, but it's an acknowledgement that, that the performers have value. What they would do is important and that, and that people care. And the other thing that the, that the audience producers, as we call them, uh, ha have done is, is allowed the rest of the people who care about this music and these performers to, to, to see the performance. And so uh, to sort of lay it out, uh, at this point, more than 200 performers have been paid uh, for their performances. Uh, more than 35,000 people have seen these performances, and uh, uh, and it, it and 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 everybody gets to feel like they're they're helping uh, and being helped. Uh, and the performers, I mean, the nice thing is that that performers who maybe wouldn't necessarily have done this uh, have, particularly very early on, said thank thank you not just to me but to to the, to the producers uh, for that little bit of money, and because I'm, I'm not going to claim it's a, it's a great deal of money, but it's 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 pretty substantial. Uh, and uh, so that that's that, that's sort of the, the, the performers were just sort of grateful for that acknowledgement uh, that that they didn't have to do everything for free. You know? that's and then great. One, one other thing that came a little bit later because I was looking for another way to do something like this, uh, that, and. Um, I, <laughs> I opened a nightclub. Uh, uh, it's a virtual nightclub. It's the only it's called Nightclub New York because the idea of it is that um, uh, the performers who live and work here are the nightclub. New York is the nightclub, and 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 the work that comes out of New York can go all over the world mm -hmm. with, with the internet. And uh, uh, the key to it was having uh, performances. You, know, you had to have product. You know, mm -hmm. it just so happened that. Uh, us, uh, a patron of ours was uh, filming, videoing all the performances that we did at Feinstein's at the Regency seven, eight, nine years ago before it closed. We had two years worth of performances plus stuff we did at the Royal Beachman Theater after that and at the Metropolitan Room. And so we had this enormous amount of, of product and uh, it just had to be transferred. I had to get per permissions from everybody. And I said to them, I don't know if this is gonna work or not, but if it does, it may be pennies that you'll get or it could be Mm -hmm. Pretty substantial amount of money, uh, depending upon things. And we had to find them over the formula and a way to do it uh, uh, so that people could access it. So now I refer to it as the Netflix of musical performance on, online because it's all by... by um, um, uh, Pay on demand? Subscription. subscription. Yes. Okay. You subscribe and you can see whatever you want as, as often as you want. And we have over 60 pr uh, performers in there. And uh, we have... Uh, uh, more than 40 mini concerts, uh, and and uh, what it is basically is an, uh, we've already we, uh, as of the end of this coming month we'll have paid out to performers more than ten thousand uh, dollars. Wow, that, and, uh, that's great. That's for and that's for work previously done because it's all archival, you know. And uh, so they're getting money for and they don't have to do anything except say yes, you can use my material. And and the idea is that it's not stuff that's on on YouTube or Facebook. It's sort of exclusive. Material uh, that people can't can't otherwise just see for free, and these uh, are all from productions that you've produced. Not all of them, most of them. Most okay. Of them. okay. Uh, and uh, uh, and the, and again, the we have extraordinary people who are who are who are part of that. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Stanley, uh, uh, is a Tony nominee. Chuck Cooper, Tony Award winner. Uh, Vian Cox, a Tony nominee. Uh, this is Brad Oscar. People like that. Uh, but and a lot of cabaret people: Natalie Douglas, Scott Coulter, Carol J. Bufford, uh, uh, Christina Bianco. The people, Richard, I know you know uh, mm -hmm. in the cabaret mm -hmm. world. Uh, so it's a mix of cabaret and Broadway people who who need an outlet, need an opportunity to make some money. And so that's that that's sort of it in a nutshell. Other than doing stuff with Town Hall, also to keep our Broadway by the year audience engaged, you know, uh, until we can finally uh, get back to the stage of Town Hall. Mm -hmm. That's great. My, my long-winded answer. <laughs> so what, what do you charge for, for subscriptions, and how do you get the word out? Um, 
uh, uh, I have a fairly large uh, email list and, and social media imprint, but I also ask everybody who, who's involved to also get the word out and help. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a kind of ripple effect of throwing the, the stone into the, into the lake. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's getting the word out that way. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, I have a press list also that I send out to. Uh, uh, we have been featured in NPR. We've been featured in the New York Times and Time Out got behind us early on. So, so we've had a lot of press support uh, as well to uh, uh, let people know about it. And, and to answer your, uh, about the nightclub, uh, it's uh, $50 uh, a, a, a month to subscribe. And that works out. I figured out if you saw everything, if you really were to binge and see everything in the club. It was 83 cents a show. Uh, uh, I joke that it to beat that Cafe Carlisle. <laughs> yeah. so, so if you take advantage of it, it's unbelievably inexpensive. Uh, right. uh, and uh, and people can also subscribe for a year. It's $500 for the year, but then you just you don't have to worry about it. You're going to get all this stuff over the course of a year. It's, it's even less than that, as long as we're able to keep feeding, you know, putting new uh, entertainment into the club, which we're always trying to do and, and keep it free. And it sounds like something you could continue even once we are back live doing shows that this would, you can continue to, you know, keep taping people and you know, yes. have them gone in perpetuity, right? Well, my theory, I think Tom could speak to this also, I think, I'm sure, that we're looking at a new world after the pandemic mm -hmm. is over. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, and I'll use this analogy, being, being a, a Yankee fan, uh, that you could go to Yankee Stadium to see the game, or you can watch it on TV if you can't go, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so that's, I think, where the future of, of, of New York entertainment is going to be for the next many, several years at least, uh, and maybe forever afterward, that, that there'll be people who will see, come and see, they want to see it live. We want them to see it live. But uh, I think it's going to be a long time before tourists are coming back to New York. I think well, Charlotte not uh, not according to what's happening in Times Square right now. Uh, well, believe it or not, the tourists are here, but the theaters are not open. I want to get Troy back. Uh, I mean, on here uh, before uh, the show gets away from us. Okay, um, Troy, I am. Uh, I've been reading about the work that you've been doing. Uh, one of the uh, fastest rising uh, conductors. Uh, you know, especially before the pandemic hit, of course. Uh, and I, where are you located right now? Are you in Venice? Uh, I'm Florida? in Los Angeles, actually, Richard. So I'm in Los Angeles right now. Um, what did your calendar look like um, on March 11th of last year? Uh, and uh, how soon uh, or how far into the year uh, was it before things started to pick up for you? It was pretty full. Being a, a full-time performer and conductor for the last 10 years, I, I can't remember my schedule being so empty. Um, you know, before COVID hit, we had a couple of concerts with Linda Etter down in Florida scheduled. Michael Feinstein was supposed to come to Kentucky and perform with the symphony there. The last, I think, movie I did and sang on was The Call of the Wilds in February. I had some Disney in concert uh, tours lined up to conduct the orchestra there around the country. So it was quite busy and then everything stopped just like Tom and Scott were saying for their uh, respective organizations. And the same thing I think that, uh, you know, that we tried to do bring to our organizations was, okay, we thought we were gonna be able to do this and maybe for a month or two, we thought, okay, we'll be able to get to that concert and there won't be an issue. Um, and then it slowly crept up on us that we're going to have to now pivot and adjust because this is going to be uh, a long battle, not a very short one. So, you know, we were able to also, at least in the um, symphonic world, um, introduce some virtual concerts. And uh, also, as Tom was saying, we did quite a bit of outdoor work. Um, the first thing I did back was in September uh on the river down in kentucky and we had actually two thousand people show up at that time and we thought the health department would shut us down but it was outside along the river because people were clamoring for live music you know mm -hmm. um and i think we were we were able to to give them at least a taste and try to do this in a different format and we've also with both orchestras in florida and kentucky have been able to offer a virtual concert series and what we also made a promise was to do that 
actually for free. We would pay the performers, but that folks wouldn't actually have to pay for that, which was very different from what most orchestras in the country are doing. And so uh, we thought that that was important because as Dr. Bloom can probably speak to, you know, while we're not literally saving lives, this has been a, a, a very emotional and detrimental period for a lot of people and missing the arts and somebody going in there with a heavy heart and wanting to, you know, clear their conscience for two hours, where was that outlet now? So we wanted to make sure that that was still viable and people didn't have to pay for that until we got back on our feet. And now we're seeing the beginnings of, you know, I finally have a concert <laughs> with Lee Greenwood coming up outside on Memorial Day weekend. So I'm, I'm hoping things are slowly getting back to a point where we can actually uh, now, you know, give, give our art form. Similar thing in the studios in Los Angeles, which I kind of moonlight in a parallel career here. You know, there's still very strict rules. Things are slowly opening up, but I haven't recorded on a movie or television for a year now. So we're finally getting able to um, to open up with still very strict COVID restrictions, Mm -hmm. Um, but there's light at the end of the tunnel is what we're seeing. Well, you said that you're in California, and I know that the restrictions for California, if I'm not mistaken, everything is supposed to open uh, at full capacity by June 15th or 16th, I think it is. Um, are, is your calendar starting to open up as well with everything? It is. It finally is. And, you know, the governor has said that June uh, June 15th is the day, as said, which is my birthday. So I'm crossing Happy my birthday. <laughs> That's a good luck charm. Uh, Mm -hmm. It is. I'm slowly starting to see things. We are putting out our schedules for both orchestras. The the Disney tour is supposedly coming back now. There are some events um, for other guest conducting orchestras in the country, and the studios are slowly getting back. So I am starting to fill up for 21, 22. I think everybody is, is, uh, and Tom and Scott are probably in the same boat, watching very carefully so that if things do unfortunately regress or change, Mm -hmm. we can adjust um, because also in our in our um, facilities right now in our um, symphonic uh, home we only have 25 percent capacity so it's not going to be worth it for us to put on 80 musicians on the stage mm-hmm. have 250 people in the hall so I think a lot of organizations are going to have to grapple with that but as we could continue and plan for the fall I think we're going to see close to, a hundred percent at least uh, with some obviously restrictions but that we can get back to gathering in in a bigger form and um, well, there's another layer uh, I was watching a concert promoter last night on TV talking about this not only are we dealing with this effort of us getting back to work but because everybody has been out of work there's going to be a glut of performers and events symphonies, Broadway shows, everything that it's like in the starting gate waiting to get through. I have a question. I want to go back to you, Tom, Uh, something that you said earlier, and then I'd like each of you to weigh in on this. And then I'd like to get uh, Dr. Bloom's perspective on this. Uh, You talked about the planning stages of what we've gone through this past year. Uh, It's almost like this start, stop uh, type of you, you think you've got everything in place only to get word that you're gonna take five steps backwards uh, for every step that you take forward. How is that affecting you psychologically in terms of how you're dealing? Obviously you've got a lot on your plate and you have a lot of people that are depending on you. How are you able, and each of you are in that position, how are you able to deal with that psychologically? It's, it's, it's been brutal, <laughs> it's been brutal. And especially I think in our industry, we're. We're, we're made up of take charge people who are good at finding solutions. And in this case, I think a lot of us were paralyzed and, and that ability to be creative, to find alternatives, I think was taken from us. Uh, you know, in my case, I got involved with the COVID theater think tank, which is an international group. And we began looking at what was going on all over the world. Soul, you know, where shows have continued to play. Uh, but but also looking to see what people were, work, were working on uh, for solutions like breath analyzers and things that, you know, would give us hope, not just for the immediate, for the long term. So, you know, even though I couldn't pivot with planning for shows, I certainly pivoted with trying to understand the science. Never in a million years would I think that I'd have on my podcast 
download list this week in virology. Uh, <laughs> but but it is. So yes. yeah, for, for, for me, it was pivoting from the show planning I'm used to doing to, to, to trying to also understand the science and how I responded to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Scott? Well, I'm a very practical person, uh, and, and and like Tom, it, it, it's it's you're looking for a solution. You know, it's, it's all about problem solving. I've always said about being a producer, all it really is is crisis management, and uh, and this is big time crisis. Uh, so to me, I, I I was always trying to step back and still do, and and I'm and I consider because I'm so I'm so New York based. Almost everything I do has to work in New York before I can work anywhere else. And we're, uh, if not the hardest hit, among the hardest hit, and, and pro probably the last to come back, uh, because it's so dense. And, and and people, I think, are afraid of the virus spreading here. Uh, you know, we can't have an outdoor experience the way you can in Southern California or in Florida. Uh, so so it really has to work in in a small space, often and, and indoors for the most part. Uh, and, and the very and I, and from a practical point of view places that have to work at 25% or 50% capacity, they can't make money. And, and certainly then they can't pay the performers very much, if anything. And, 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 and this, it's, and, and I think it's, a, I hate to be dour about this, but uh, the sense of things opening up, we need that, we, psychologically, we need that to know that that's gonna happen. And obviously I think it will, it's just a question of when. And, and I don't think it's gonna happen quite as soon as, as we would all like in terms of people getting back to work and making a living again. They, uh, so at the top end, the big Broadway shows, I think they'll play. The lesser shows that, that don't have the big stars in them, you know, uh, uh, the Music Man will sell tickets, you know, but, but some show that comes in without Hugh Jackman and Sutton Foster, maybe not. Uh, and and the Kristen Chenowitz and people like that they will tour and they will make money. But the but the meat and potatoes people who who are the backbone of of uh, the theater and, and nightclubs who are not not famous famous but uh, have their little followings and 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 need to work uh, and and have made a living as as performers they're going to have the hardest time uh, because the money isn't going to be there for them until later. Mm -hmm. And and that's the problem I'm trying to solve mm -hmm. uh, is is how do we keep those lights on uh, for those people between now and then? Mm -hmm. And Troy, well, for me, uh, you know, my experience as a performing musician for the last twenty years has and uh, basically defined me. So to shut that down for the first time in my life, I found it very difficult. Actually, mm -hmm. you know, I've been touring and concertizing pretty much my whole life. Um, and so, you know, from the time I was in school, to have this be so abrupt and, and, and so uh, succinct and, and, and not really know what was happening, uh, I, I did retreat a little bit, you know, and I, I almost went back into my craft and I said, okay, well, you know, I'll bide my time and, and I'm going to work on, on um, what I need to until we get to a point where we can open up again. And so there was a little bit of self-introspectiveness there to actually take hold and say, okay, you know, well, what I can make the best of it. And <laughs> almost as if I was in jail being in Los Angeles here where nothing was open, you really had to just be confined and, and, um, and do your best. And, and then after a couple of months, it really became clear that, okay, I'm also responsible for a lot of performing artists like Scott is and, and Tom. And so how do we actually, if I'm hurting, they must be even more so. And so, you know, how do we actually get to a point where we can um, at least um, not just financially, but emotionally offer some support? And then, of course, we, we delved into um, the virtual aspects and outdoors and what we could actually do, meet the musicians, concert series and, and virtual podcasts and all these other things and kind of take stock of things we never do, rebranding and our website and focusing on the musicians and at least with my orchestras, you know, and for my own personal self, I found it actually kind of refreshing to do things 
um, that I never delve into or have time, like cooking, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, but it uh, it did give me a few more gray hairs for the first couple of months because I was just used to going, 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 and to stop. <laughs> it still looks great, Richard. So <laughs> this is all within the last year. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we have to look forward to. <laughs> yes. Uh, Dr. Bloom. Yeah, you know it. One of the things I think everybody can kind of expect to happen, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, is that people are, are suffering from what we call cave syndrome. They've been, you know, locked up, you know, they've been in the cave and they've kind of gotten used to that. So now coming back out into the world feels a little scary to a lot of people. Certainly anybody who has any kind of underlying social anxiety disorder is gonna be particularly affected by that. But even other people who are normally people who would be going out are being cautious. They're still being cautious and just a little bit fearful that, that you know, maybe these vaccine things aren't gonna work that well, or you know, maybe we're gonna wind up having you know, new strains that are gonna you know, get us, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's some benefit in some of the rules like that you're gonna be opening, you know, starting with 25% and then probably going to 50% and slowly, kind of slowly ramping up because it gives people a chance to also slowly ramp up, get used to sitting next to somebody, you know, that they don't know, right? You know, that that's gonna be a real uh, shock to a lot of systems, just getting back into that. And I would think that probably is gonna affect some performers as well. Um, and musicians, you know, who have, who have to sit right on top of each other, basically, right? You know, you're going to be seeing some people who get a, get a little anxious about all that, mm -hmm. and then slowly relax into it as we see that things are going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think that those are just kind of things to keep in mind as we do this. Mm -hmm. As I look at this year, I think of this as a pause. I think it's a time mm -hmm. for us to all pause and think about those things that we had in our lives that we miss the things that matter to us, the things that we don't even want in our lives anymore. And I'm gonna start with you again, Tom. Um, looking back over the past year, how has this year impacted you in a way that you feel that maybe an adjustment that you've made in terms of the way that you do your business, the way that you run your corporations? Um, how do you feel that this year has impacted you and what lessons have you taken out of this year that you think will move forward uh, beyond COVID? Well, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge that there's been a convergence of so many things that go beyond COVID. When you layer on what's happened with Black Lives Matter and social justice and uh, people working from home uh, the, the head of Google Live Events, I was part of a group that he spoke to and said, we've had 10 years of change in 10 months. Wow. And, it, and it's all these things together. And particularly, you know, uh, for those of us that are in performing arts centers that serve multi-disciplines, I, I, I do think many of us really have, uh, you know, taken on the reflection of, of, of looking at our relevance and, and reflecting on social justice and community engagement. And I think we're going to see dramatic positive transformation in how many of us are going to be more relevant to our communities. Uh, so so I, I, I'm really hopeful and I'm, and, and I'm so eager to get back in the game because I think we can do better on so many fronts. And the arts can be a real healer in our community. We can be a part of resetting our entire country. Uh, but again, this convergence of all these things together uh, is something that I think we're, we're all still trying to process and understand. Absolutely. Scott? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> very difficult. Uh, uh, but I, I, agree with, I agree with Tom about, about the, the quick change that's happening uh, and, and that as I said before, I think the world's going to be very different in the arts uh, after after this is finally over. You know, I look back to the Spanish flu when, um, which by the way didn't uh, started in Kansas uh, in, a, in a barracks in, uh, in America. Actually, that's where it began, uh, parenthetically. But the um, 
you don't see anybody, when you look at the art of the 20s, nobody mentions it. It's not in any, it's not, there's no references in theater or movies. It's like, it never happened because people didn't want to look back at it. They didn't want to, they didn't want to remember it really. Uh, but I think it's going to, there'll be some, I don't think you're going to see movies with people with masks on, you know, uh, except almost as, as, a, as a comic reference, you know, mm -hmm. uh, after this is over. Because I think people are going to desperately want to move on. Mm -hmm. But they are going to move on in, in the ways Tom says, I think, that, that a lot of the social change uh, is, is, is happening quickly. And I think this is a really great point for Judy to, to, to discuss, uh, is when change happens that fast, the social dislocation is huge. And people mm -hmm. are really nervous and, and anxious about how the, the the world underneath them is changing so rapidly, and they can't adapt to it so fast, and they don't want to adapt to it so fast. So there could be a bit of a backlash to that that we have to be aware of. Um, and 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 as Tom said, I mean, I think the art the arts lead the way in this. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they always do to uh, to sort of establish uh, uh, the new norm. What's normal? Uh, we look to the movies and theater and, and, and all the arts to sort of tell us what's normal, you know, what, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll know. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, Troy, your thoughts? Well, this, this topic's very apropos right now. I just gave an interview about this and how literally we may not be saving lives like a surgeon in the arts, but in these dark and turbulent times, I mean, the arts remain a beacon of hope. Somebody may come into the concert hall or the theater going through a death, a divorce, domestic abuse, and I'm sure Dr. Bloom can speak to more of this than I. And, you know, for two hours, we can give them a lot more than their money is worth, you know? I mean, for two hours, we can actually give them a bit of hope and healing. And I think, um, you know, we're always spending so much time, and I'm sure Tom and Scott would agree with me, on justifying why it is we need the arts and why music's important in the school system, and I spend a lot of time doing that. Um, Rather than, I think, being a little bit more introspective and saying we need this because humans have gone have never gone without it, you know, especially in turbulent times. Um, and, and so I think, you know, as Tom was saying, the convergence of all of these issues right now, um, it's 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 an appropriate time for the arts to be the leader in, in, in coming together um, for these types of, of of healing activities after such a you know, um, emotional roller coaster ride. And I think it's also a time too, at least for myself as a performing artist, to really never take anything for granted. And I have to say, I never have before, but it, you know, I, I deal with a lot of people in the industry who are very much entitled to, you know, um, what they think they should have or, 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 or where they should be. And I think actually COVID has really made us realize it is a gift and it's a, especially in, in, in the work I do in the music field where these great artists have to take such great care and be training for decades and it's a lifelong craft. And, and unlike, uh, not unlike the theater or anywhere other, any other art, but I think, um, you know, I do see a lot of entitlement on that, on that front. And now uh, I, I think everybody's got a different perspective to say, all right, I'm not actually gonna take that for granted. It's a privilege. Not necessarily a, a right to perform this music or to perform this, and and so I think, um, at least from my perspective, I have a greater sense of gratitude on how lucky uh, we are to do what we love for a living. You know? So that that's that's kind of encapsulates it for me. That's great. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Bloom. Yeah, you know, one of the things I um, ask my patients all the time is, "What brings you joy?" Right? What what at any point in your life, think back to your childhood. Okay, what really mattered to you? What made you happy? What brought you joy, right? Uh, what could you sink your teeth into and smile? Um, and the creative arts are, you know, always towards the top of people's lists. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, you know, I think that that's really important for us to all embrace that, you know, this is the arts are healing on so many levels, whatever kind of art we're talking about, whether it's, you know, everything from painting and sculpture to music and dance and, you know, performance and theater of all kinds, movies, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's what, we all, what we all have as a common experience. Um, and we can 
look at this stranger sitting next to us who's also laughing at the same thing we're laughing at. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's that's so much of, of what uh, you know. I know I am grateful mm -hmm. for for what all of you do um, to br to bring that to the rest of us. And I think that that as people, you know, start emerging from their caves, they're gonna they are hungry for that at their at their at their core level. They're hungry for it. So even though they may be a bit gun shot <laughs> at first, um, they will come back. That's for sure. You know, uh, it may take a little while, but that's okay. You know, we're going to get there. And I, you know, I love actually, you know, one of the side benefits, if you will, from all of this is the explosion and availability for people all over the world to take part in seeing all of you wonderful people perform. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's, you know, like what, what Scott's, you know, doing with, with, with the New York um, uh, nightclub thing. Mm -hmm. So, it's, you know, I, that's, and that's going to be ongoing. That's mm -hmm. going to be ongoing. So, you know, the, the fact that we've really broadened the base tremendously that way, I think is a real benefit. Now, before uh, we're almost at the end of our show, but before we get there, I've got one last question that I want to ask each of you, and then we'll wrap everything up in a nice big bow today. Um, and I want to take this from Bill Maher, who I was watching last uh, uh, Friday night, and his closing monologue was about all of the angst that we're seeing in all of the top Academy Award winning films. Uh, when I think of the 1930s and the 40s and the type of film and work that came out of that, people wanted an escape. They wanted to escape what was going on out there. And it's like Scott just said, I don't think as we move forward that we want to see people wearing masks and face shields and everything, that we want to get away from that. And the question that I have for each of you is, do you think that the fact that we've all gone through uh, COVID and there are all these cultural changes that are taking place as well, how it will impact the art that you create moving forward? Tom. I, yeah, I, th I, I, I think it is going to influence it. And I, and I think we're, especially the next year or so, we, we need to find some middle ground between being mired in where we're at and, and actually ignoring it. I, we, we do a big uh, international festival in the, in the fall, which we're doing this year. And one of the major projects we're doing has a call for poems where we're asking people to write poems and lyrics that reflect on what their experience has been and their hopes for the future. And we're going to turn those into big public art pieces around our city. So we're trying to find ways to meaningfully reflect on what we've been through, but with a hopeful vision for the future. So we're not mired in the anxiety of the past, but looking ahead, but acknowledging we have all been through so much. I love that. Yeah. Yes, I love that as well, Scott. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> what what art will be like, uh, music and nightclubs will be like afterward is is a big question mark. Um, I'm I'm hoping that that it will be reflected in a in a in an ex a kind of exuberance. I, I'm I'm hearing a lot of people saying that as soon as things open up, it's going to be like the Roaring Twenties. Mm -hmm. uh, and which, which is actually a reflection of what happened after the. Well, we are living in the Roaring Twenties. Well, yeah, I mean that that's <laughs> sort of happening. Uh, uh, well, oh, in the, the 2020s, yes. yes. But uh, 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 good one. <laughs> but I, I think that uh, there's going to be a sense of anything goes. I mean, a lot of people are feeling that they lost a year of their life, uh, and and they want to make up for it. I. I Part of my a significant part of my audience is older, and and a lot of them have have sort of ignored the COVID restrictions in a lot of ways uh, because they felt I don't want to, I can't afford to lose a year of my life at this stage of my life. I'm going to take my chances and live, you know. And uh, that's sort of very bold and courageous uh, in in one way, and a little foolish in another. But but even so, it reflects a feeling of of uh, of really want to rushing into the new, this new time. I think there's going to be a real explosion of uh, uh, at a certain point when people, as people start to feel more and more safe, as Dr. Bloom was saying, uh, the cautious ones will hold back, but the, but the ones who are not cautious are gonna race out there and, 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 and uh, eat, drink, and be merry, and hopefully uh, listen to some music. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Troy? 
Well, yeah, I'm hopeful there'll be a resurgence. I, I know there will be, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of feeling the way I felt after 9-11 where that changed our world and it changed the way we went through security, it changed the way we went through airports. And that's, I think, some of those things are going to be sticking around, I think, and I don't have a crystal ball, but at least in the orchestra world, you know, the way we, and Tom was uh, alluding to this before, we how we study air filtration and the flow of air through the instruments and the way the orchestra is set up, you know, those types of things actually may now um, gain our attention to, to try to do it in a different way. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but at the heart of the matter, of course, is what we all do is live performance for the most part. I think virtual performing will still be around. And as Dr. Bloom was saying, the great thing about it is it's reaching so many people. You know, uh, we, we had our holiday special on KET, an affiliate of PBS, and there were people in Alaska watching that that would never know about you know, an orchestra in Kentucky. So that's a positive, and I think that will remain. But I think at the crux of it is people are dying for live performance. We just gave our uh, subscribers in Florida, who are mostly 65 and over crowd, um, a, a survey to see if they would come back in November. And overwhelmingly, like 78% said wow. absolutely, which was interesting because those are the most at-risk population. But I think there is a clamoring for getting back to live performance. And as Tom was saying, we do have to find some middle ground on how we do that safely. But at the end of the day, all of these other things are going to augment what we do in person. Thank you. Dr. Bloom? Yeah, well, I think it's time to polish your dancing shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, we, everyone in the creative community, you know, it's, it's, it, this is a chance to make sure you, you cross the, you know, the T's and dotted the I's and whatever you're working on, you're ready for people to see it. This is audition time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we're going to be getting out there and, you know, not, maybe not, you know, in, in a rush, but we are getting out there and we got to be ready. So be ready. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank everybody for being here. Tom, Scott, Troy, I hope it wasn't painful for you. Um, <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, and I want to let the three of you know, anything that you're doing, anything you want to promote, uh, my uh, page on Facebook is a forum to support other artists. So feel free to let everyone know what you're doing so that people can uh, stay in touch and continue to see the work that you're putting out there. I want to thank everybody for watching today's show. Um, whatever platform you're either watching this on, if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening on the Apple podcast on the various platforms, please leave a rating. Uh, leave a comment. Uh, Tom, Scott, Troy, go to YouTube. Let everybody know what your experience was for doing this because that helps get the word out with what Dr. Bloom and I are doing. Um, it's important to get the word out. Scott, you know this better than anybody I know. Uh, <laughs> getting the word out, getting the word out. So thank you. Um, I always end all of my personal shows um, and I will do this today as well to say, um, reach out to those people in your life that matter to you. Um, as my dear friend David Friedman says, uh, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you don't know what someone else is going through right now. Um, have a little empathy for what people are going through. If someone is not wearing a mask and that upsets you, cross to the other side of the street. Don't engage in a discourse that's going to uh, make someone a little bit more angrier than they currently are. Um, but reach out to your friends, let them know uh, especially now with more than anything. Um, I'm going to give each of you a final word. Uh, you can say anything um, to uh, build upon anything that we've talked about today, uh, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish that we had, or just any message that you want to put out to everyone. And I'm going to go backwards this time, and I'm going to start with you, Troy. I'm just going to say, you know, like the famous song, Richard, smile, though your heart may be weary, right? And I think um, we're all in this together and we're all going to come back full force and the arts will be there un until the end of time. And we are here, you know, also as leaders in the community to make sure that that happens. Amen. Yes. Scott. Uh, ever so briefly, I, 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 I'm just wishing uh, some good health and, and, and a happy future for 
for uh, all of our performers because uh, they, they're the ones who I think, uh, while they have to lead with the message, they're also the ones who have, in some ways, the biggest burden uh, of, of, of keeping keeping the light uh, shining on on them. Uh, they're used to the spotlight, but not necessarily when it's so harsh uh, uh, and 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 burning them. Uh, so I, I, I just I, my 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 wishes are for the performers to 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 be able to rise above this problem, basically. Amen, Tom. The, what I've been sharing with my staff is to savor this year ahead, savor the restart of our venues and start of the arts in our community, because I think it's going to be a remarkable year because people are going to be coming back to the arts with a new appreciation. You know, I, I think we're going to see people sit down in our seats for the first time and shed a tear. Mm -hmm. And and so for us to I, I just think savor what that means, what the arts mean to our community and the reaffirmation that what we do matters. I think it's gonna be a year to savor. Thank you. Dr. Bloom. Start taking baby steps. If you're anxious about getting, getting out there, being around people again, being around live events again, find a friend who's also been vaccinated and meet up with them in person outdoors someplace. Start slowly getting yourself acclimated to being around other people. And that will make a big difference and help you get ready to go to one of these wonderful performances. Amen. Everyone go out and create great art and make it a better tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.